Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing great here today. My name is Kishore Kalano. I'm a director of data engineering at Capital One. I'm here today to give my insights and perspectives about how to boost Snowflake developer productivity. I'm not alone here. Joining me on stage is David Els. He's from Capital One too. <laughs> Today's agenda, the data engineer's dilemma, and how to make software, uh, data testing closer to the software testing and how slingshot testing framework will answer that or solve the challenge. And then we'll talk about how to do a shift left mechanism in the testing. Before we go into the agenda, we'll take a minute and talk about Capital One. Those, those who know Capital One, they look at it as a financial institute. We are technology first company. In 2017, we entirely re-architected re our data ecosystem on the cloud to, to manage the data at scale and lay the foundation for AIML. In 2022, we launched Capilon software, uh, which offers solutions to have a data management capability. And our first product was Slingshot. Product is Slingshot. It's still in there. So what it does is we built something uh, in-house a data management capability, and now we opened it for other businesses to leverage their cloud investments like Snowflake. Uh, past April, we launched DataBolt, which is a tokenization solution uh, at scale. Uh, like this is now offered outside Capital One as, as a uh, SaaS offering. What it does is now you can tokenize your data, secure your data at scale. That being said, right, today, Capital One's ecosystem, the modern data ecosystem, data, uh, and also AIML foundation is a very core value for Capital One. Data engineer's dilemma. Typically, data application consists of a lot of di diverse producers and diverse kind of workloads. We ingest all this data into a central repository, and we build a lot of applications on that central repository. And that comes, we have a lot of consumers who are using, consuming those applications. To make sure the quality of that application is great, in a good trade, there is a lot of data testing needed. So data testing is hard. Why is that so hard, right? So we, we typically get a lot of disparate data sources. They have wide variety of volumes, formats, and cadences. And there's interdependencies between the data, uh, data things and like, you know, their interdependent of systems. All this, when we are doing the testing at scale, it, is a, it becomes not only a challenge to solve the problem, but it's too much expensive. So, like, when we put the perspective, like, you know, software testing with the data testing, Let's take a deep dive, like how software testing can get a solution for data testing. Software testing pyramid is typically like you have like unit testing, component testing, and integration testing. The unit testing is a lot faster, easier, and cheaper. When it go to the integration testing, it, is, it, it turns out to be more expensive and slower too. Usually unit testing is like you have a simple method or construct, we are testing it, and once you go to the component testing, you are expecting a payload or some, some kind of a payload from the API. And once you go to the integration testing, you are looking at whole applications to be working seamlessly. Let's put that perspective to the data application testing today. It has the same thing, like you know, unit testing, component testing, and integration testing. But in the same way, like unit testing is a lot faster and easier. And when you go all the way high, it's uh, slower and more expensive. When it comes to data, right, stored procedure, we just test the stored procedure and we then there in the unit testing. When you go to the component testing, we integrate the stored procedure with the ETL table or a regular table. When you go to the integration testing, we test whole end-to-end -end pipeline. Although when you look at compare software testing with the data testing, right, Unit testing doesn't change anything. But when it goes to the component testing and integration testing, the data application is unique. Like, you know, it cannot be in the same manner. 
That being said, right, how do we solve this challenge? Slingshot testing framework has a solution, and I'll hand over to David, who will walk us through the solution. Thanks, Kishore. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Ellis. Um, so I'm going to talk about how the Slingshot testing framework helps solve some of these problems. So at its core, the Slingshot testing framework is a library that we wrote in-house to help solve these data engineering challenges. So the mission statement for the library, the framework, is to empower developers with production-like data during the testing phases of the de uh, development lifecycle. When we set out to build this, the first question is, what does success look like? So this is the same set of challenges that Keyshore outlined before, disparate sources, statefulness, and cost. How can we build something that helps us be co gain confidence in each of these things earlier as we're developing our applications? That manifests itself into two distinct objectives. The first one is to bring production-like data to the test suite. And number two is to enable performance validations at test time. Basically, can we make performance a first-class assertion? So let's start talking about the framework itself. So at the 30,000-foot view, this is the way it works. You construct resources via configuration files in YAML. These resources, they can be anything in Snowflake. They can be Snowflake tables. They can be Snowflake streams, tasks, any object. But the point is that you declaratively define the thing that you want to create. So in this case, if you're building a table, you're building fields. And we'll talk more about what the exact contents of this configuration file is. But you define it here. In your test code, you actually consume this YAML file. And what the, what the framework exposes is a, is a set of interfaces that consumes this and allows you to dynamically generate data for your test. So the way that looks is we have a definition class. That's what reads the YAML file. You then create the Snowflake table object. Right? Again, this can be a Snowflake table. You have a Snowflake view class, Snowflake stream class. You then use the data generator, which is exposed by the framework, to actually create the data. And then the last step is that you generate and load the table. The end result is this. At test time, ephemerally, you have data that you need according to the test cases that you're trying to run. So it allows you to do some really powerful things like mocking out edge cases and what we'll talk about putting performance under test two. OK, so I'm going to go through each of the different problems and explain how this framework helps us solve them. So the first one is the disparate sources. Remember that objective one is to bring production-like data to the test suite. So to highlight this, what I want to do is go through this configuration file. So it starts at the top level. You define the object that you're trying to create. So in this case, we're creating a table called warehouse load. You then define the attributes of that table. These attributes will be different based on the kind of object. But obviously, for a table, you're going to define fields. We have what we call constant constraints. Right? So this is to say every row in the table that gets built by this configuration file is going to have the values for these columns that you see here. Right? So they'll have a name defined, they'll have a data type, and then they'll have the actual value that'll go in the column. We also have variable attributes. Right? So this will allow you to um, build data sets that are constrained according to however you need. So for instance, let's say one of your columns is a percentage. Right? You know that the percentage has to be between 0 and 100. The framework will randomly, in this case, decide a number for you. The second objective was to solve for statefulness. So we do this in a very similar way. On the left is the same configuration file, and on the right is the second one. Statefulness is all about relationships. So in this case, what we can do is we can build, using those constant constraints, we can build these relationships between the two tables or the two objects. And you can do this n number of times, right? Like this is a simple example with two, but you can do this any number of times that you want to create these relationships. And the last thing is testing for performance and cost. I thought the easiest way to show how this works is to actually give a code snippet for one of our tests. So you can see here, just say we're using PyTest as the, as the runner. So we have a Snowflake performance test class, and we have one test case called test data analysis proc performance 100 million rows. So the first part of this test is to do all of the data creation that we just talked about through the YAML and configuration file and the uh, different interfaces. You run the thing that's under test. So in this case, it's the data analysis proc. And we have what we call a performance observer, which can actually collect the results of the thing that was just tested, which exposes some really interesting data about the test. In this case, namely, what we're interested in is its runtime. There's other interesting things that you can get from this as well, partitions, scans, those kinds of things. But what I'm trying to highlight here is that assert query runtime is a first class assertion. Right? So this tells you during your CI run or whenever you're running this that 
the performance that I expect from this model or stored procedure or Snowpark fun, whatever it is, is meeting the expectation from a performance perspective, which is really powerful. So now I want to talk about how this lets us shift left. So when I say shift left, what I'm talking about is taking all of the important parts of the software delivery lifecycle, the testing, the validations, the cost observation, and bringing it as left as we can and try to get it all the way to the developer. So the way we're going to talk about this is to talk about different kinds of testing and where they happen in the SDLC. So up at the top, there's a key that shows color coding the different kinds of testing at a high level. And then what we're going to talk about as we go here is the different phases of the SDLC and how testing looks. So for the beginning part, this is before the slingshot testing framework. This is what life was like. Local development, you can run unit tests. Right? This is typically what we see most often, right? usually have like 80% coverage rules, that kind of thing. Developer on their local machine, they can run unit tests that are testing the inner functionalities of whatever the thing is that they're building. At PR time, the reviewer of the code is left to read those tests to understand what is this you know, person trying to write. And this is one of the interesting nuances about data applications is that you're typically like situational, right? You have to know more about the context of what's happening around the, so the stored procedure or whatever it is that you're building to, to really understand. And so it can be really hard. Uh, and this is one of the things I'll talk about how the testing framework helps with that. During CI, you've only got unit tests at this point. So this is what you're running. You're running unit tests in CI. Only once you get to pre-prod can you do any sort of component or integration testing, right? Because the thing that you're building has dependencies outside of itself. And those dependencies don't exist anywhere else. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure people have tried to solve this problem as well. Pre-prod maintenance is really hard. It's really expensive, and it's really hard. Typically, don't see edge cases like you do in production. Volumes are almost never the same. Uh, and so this is available to you, but often has its challenges too. You'll see the black circle comes up for the first time in production deployment and validation. Big reason for that. You can't do performance testing if you don't have production data volumes. Right? So you are now at step five in this SDLC, and you are just now able to say, like, the thing that I wrote is performant to my expectation. And then the funnest part is that you do cost testing after it's done. You release it, you watch it, and you cross your fingers that it doesn't uh, blow up and you get a call from somebody you don't want. So this is what it was like. This is the problem we're trying to solve against. right? But the big take home message here is that data application devs, they're performing mission critical testing outside of their development environment. This leads to the longer dev cycles and higher cost risks. What does it look like after our implementation of the framework? We can bring all of these things to the left. So even in the developer's local environment, on their machines, right, they can run unit testing. They can simulate production environments. They can simulate production volumes. They can do performance assertions as a part of the test. All of these things give confidence. So devs can emulate prod-like data environments locally without dependencies on other systems. One of the really cool improvements here is that this actually helps PR reviews, right? Because now your tests are declarative. You can, you can look at somebody else's code, and you can understand automatically, like, this is what they're trying to do. This is how well they expect it to perform. These are the dependencies that are expected to be met, even though you're not the one who wrote the code and are trying to solve that problem. CI pipelines, you can now federate the confidence, right? Because these standards are in place, everyone knows, engineers, team leads, everyone is confident that if it passes CI, there's no regression, right? You can be confident in this system without the fear of like, well, did we test it against this other thing that we wrote you know, six months ago? One of the unexpected uh, improvements that we found is that it actually allows us to reduce our maintenance costs and effort in non-prod environments, right? If you don't need pre-prod to have, like, be very robust and to be very production-like, you can actually save costs there. And I think you know, this is a situational thing I don't want to say this was one of the objectives that we set out to create or to solve for when we started here, but uh, it's been actually like a really cool, it, and it makes sense uh, looking back. Obviously, you're doing less in production, right? You don't need to wait to find the production performance. You don't need to wait for those nuances. So you actually don't need to go into production as often, which is always, always a good thing. And of course, post-production release, you're still going to watch for costs, but that green circle has showed up four times by now, right? So you're not. You're not as interested. You're not as worried about, like, OK, I deployed this on Monday. What, is, what am I seeing on Wednesday and Thursday? So how do we do? OK, so we set out with two objectives. Bring production-like data to the test suite and enable performance validations at test time. Both of these things are met. 
And really what this allows is full control of cost and performance at all stages of the development lifecycle. The developer really is empowered to do everything that they need to on their machine. And it's just all of the stages benefit uh, from this framework. So thank you all for coming.